Hey everybody, Dr. Sandal here with Opma Clinic, breaking the boundaries of mainstream medicine. And today I am talking shift with my friend Susie Roman. She is an incredibly talented cranial sacral therapist. And today we're going to be talking about neurologic health. Well, thank you. That's a very generous introduction. And um, I, I predominantly work with children these days. And um, I would say that the the number one thing that I get with children is more neurodiversity and behavior issues mm -hmm. that are coming into my office. I mean, occasionally we do get some, some other structural things, but in my work with children, it all leads back to central nervous system health mm -hmm. and functioning. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, oftentimes I walk through families and trying to figure out a diagnosis for their child. So we're mm -hmm. seeing some mm -hmm. of these things, um, developmental delays or, some neurodivergent behavior in toddlerhood and the parents start to say wait a minute something's not quite right here mm -hmm. and uh, i'd say all the time that mama guts are by far um are superior to to any diagnostic test i think that's uh, out there. Is the gut feeling the gut yeah, feeling yeah. and so um oftentimes mothers are the ones that are identifying this mm -hmm. before their healthcare providers uh -huh. Um, and so I, I walk through um, these instances with families when we're trying to figure out, is it autism? Is it ADHD? And mm -hmm. um, from, from all the research and experience that I've uh, had a pleasure of being a part of, I'd actually like to zoom out and really look at it through the lens of sensory processing disorder. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And so sensory processing disorder is, is rarely understood um, or even talked about much. And um, really, sensory processing disorder is a very large umbrella term for central nervous system processing challenges. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then from there, it's broken down into subsets. Mm -hmm. And um, I really feel that if we look at some of these neurodivergent characteristics through the lens of sensory processing, rather than through the lens of an autism spectrum disorder mm -hmm. or um, ADHD, we could actually work with the child and work with the central nervous system and meet them with therapies that actually improve functioning mm -hmm. rather than an autism spectrum disorder or ADHD. There's a lot of uh, emphasis on the diagnosis in conventional yes. medicine. And I talk about this a lot, and one of the things that we do very differently than a lot of clinics is we're less focused on the, the what I would call the, the distal syndrome than we are on the, the proximal cause. We want to figure yes. out what the root cause to these things are. And one of the troubles that I think conventional medicine finds itself getting into very, very often is it wants to fit everybody into a box. Yes. But child A and child B are not the same thing. Yeah. And so I say, oh, you have the same general diagnosis as this person loses a ton of detail. We basically kind of scrub the nuance that is really critically important for a lot of this. You know, when we think about ADHD and autism on the rise as, you know, kind of across our society, these are giant buckets. And to kind of chuck everybody into that yes. bucket mm -hmm. basically scrubs the nuance out of the situation. Absolutely. And we're nuanced beings. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't we don't perform well, nor do nor do we as healthcare providers perform well if we don't get all the details. Yes, and that's exactly the point I would like people to see when I ask them to zoom out and look at things as a sensory processing mm -hmm. disorder. Because once we start to look at how that child is responding to sensory uh, stimuli in their environment, we can actually cater into their specific mm -hmm, presentation. Mm -hmm. So getting more um, granular with it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so is it auditory? Is it visual? Mm. You know, is it tactile? And mm. once we can actually look, I mean, look at a child um, or really anybody through the lens of how they are processing the sensations in their environment, we mm -hmm. really tailor, mm. um, we tailor meeting those needs instead. And like I said, I tell, I tell parents all the time, once you know, once we put something in the bo in a box, we kill it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And um, diagnoses can be blessings and curses mm -hmm. all at the same time. And blessings in the fact that they could give us um, some information and some enlightenment, and even 
you know, in the insurance world, get us access to services right. um, where if without a diagnosis, we don't, we don't actually get access to services and information and care. But at the same time, once we start looking through at somebody, as you mentioned, through a, through a, such a, um, a narrowed lens, uh -huh. yeah, we, we then miss, we miss so mm -hmm. much about that individual. And um, I, I can't tell you the number of children that I work with that their parents were told that if this is what's going on by their healthcare providers, mm -hmm. and this is how we're going to treat it, and this mm -hmm. is what you can expect from it. Mm -hmm. And when we come in and we're working with the children um, through the lens that, that I work with uh, children at, and that's through craniosacral therapy, but again, through the lens of let's see how they're processing sensory stimuli in their environment, mm -hmm. um, we unlock the mm -hmm. central nervous system for these children and things that their healthcare providers told them were not possible are happening right in front of our faces. Right. There, there's a big shift that needs to happen in the way that we think about neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people don't believe that these things are possible. You know, we've somehow as a culture got into this position of thinking that if someone has an MD by their name, they understand all of the science. Mm -hmm. And you know, don't get me wrong, I'm an MD myself, I like MDs, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to disparage them, but they exist in a system that provides a very particular type of service. It's quite regimented and structured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is quite limited in many regards in what it can provide. And so when someone goes to an MD and they say, hey, I'm worried my, my child is behaving oddly, mm -hmm. and they go through their testing and they send them for an evaluation with a specialist, and the specialist says, oh, here's your diagnosis, mm -hmm. The MD in their system, their, their, the system they've been trained in says, okay, well, for this diagnosis, we do this. Yep. This is the limit of what can happen with this. This is the treatment we do for this. And of course, we are all unique individuals. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of variance outside of what people think can happen and what the science has studied. And of course, this completely misses the point that's more important that science is constantly evolving. Yeah. Right? And most MDs, they really haven't boned up on these things for 10, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So what's new? What's happening? It takes a very, very good MD to really get into um, all of that research and be totally up to date. And of course, you know, we have specialization for that. Mm -hmm. But then one of the other limitations is mm -hmm. the specialists are yes. focused on just this. On pieces and parts. Right. And not the integrated whole. Right. And Which is where a lot of the juice lies in yes. a person. In a person, yes, we are an integrated whole, and um, you know the the foundations, um, the foundations of practice that I follow that are foundations of craniosacral therapy. But craniosacral therapy is an osteopathic approach, uh -huh, so it has uh -huh. its roots in osteopathic medicine. And the foundational principles of this work is that um, you know the body is an integrated whole mm -hmm. or an integrated unit mm -hmm. that uh, the body is um, self correcting. Mm -hmm. and um and that form relates to function hmm. interesting and okay. those are the three foundations that we um are addressing uh or our lens i should say our perspective in our lens and so um i will say if you would like an example um a case study so Please. to speak there was there was a child who was two and a half who came to see me and i will use they them pronouns just for anonymity's sake um and this child um, was not speaking at two and a half. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they had taken them to the pediatrician. The pediatrician refers them to an ENT. Mm -hmm. ENT looks and says, uh, this child has enlarged adenoids and tonsils. Okay. This child has fluid on their ears. Okay. Um, no wonder they're not talking because they can't hear. Mm -hmm. uh, we would like to put tubes in the ears. Mm -hmm. We would like to remove tonsils and adenoids. Mm -hmm. um, That's a lot of intervention. That's a lot. So yeah. this mother was looking at, you know, all of these slice and dice options mm -hmm. for their child. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily we had the experience of meeting each other years prior. Mm. And she got a hold of me and said, this is what's happening. What's your perspective? Mm -hmm. And I said, bring them in and let's see what happens next. Uh -huh. So this child did have fluid on their ears. This child did have enlarged tonsils and adenoids. Mm. This child was a mouth breather. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, really mm. what we saw in the craniosacral system, which the craniosacral system um, is 
Well, I should back up and explain what that is real quick. But inside every single body, there's a thick connective tissue that lines the skull and the sp spine. Mm -hmm. um, we refer to that as the dura. Oftentimes, it's also referred to as the meninges. Mm -hmm. But that's the casing for the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. It's the sac that holds the cerebral spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. child had significant restrictions in that layer of tissue. Uh, what it was doing was causing a shortening of the spine and a dislocation of the cranial base. Um, yeah. And that uh, was causing restrictions in nasal breathing. Uh -huh, and so uh -huh. what I love is the body has this amazing ability to adapt in yeah, this function. Right. We have backup systems for our backup systems. Right. It's miraculous to witness. And so our nose is our primary you know, avenue of breath. And if we look at the nose, it's facing down. Um, it has, mm -hmm. uh, so the nostrils are down towards the ground. They're not up and exposed. Mm -hmm. There's nose hair, there's mucus that mm -hmm. lines. And so this is trapping free radicals. This is, you know, uh, this is protecting us from viruses and bacteria. Um, and when this isn't working, our backup system is our mouth. Right. And so when a child or when anybody starts mouth breathing, what we see is this beautiful adaptation of the tonsils and adenoids enlargement. Mm. Um, and that's just to protect us, Makes you know, right. they don't have the benefit of the mucus and the nares. And the, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so now they become enlarged and, and close in on the throat mm. so that they are now protecting the individual from the free radicals in right, the air. Right. And so I'm curious why we would want to just remove these structures. <laughs> well, you don't, don't get me started on that. Yes. Right? Like the, the degree <laughs> to which historically as physicians, we've just hacked stuff out because ah, we don't really need it. It I'm... is pretty amazing. <laughs> yes. You know, I think already this is starting to happen, but certainly in the near future, we'll look at these sort of practices the same way that we looked at bloodletting. You know, Absolutely. I think people are kind of like, wow, that was really aggressive and caused a lot of harm. Well, back then, they just thought that, yeah. was, that was just the standard of care. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's what insurance paid for. Right? Absolutely. Like, just do the thing. Yeah. So all we did with this individual, um, with this particular individual, um, is, you know, we applied craniosacral therapy. We softened up the restrictions in his in their dural membrane system. Uh, they began to breathe better. They began to be less rigid. They mm -hmm. began to have more mm -hmm. fluidity, and we uh, were able to correct some alignment issues. From there, the ears were draining. From there, yeah, the nose right, was right. working. And this child, all uh, that tissue is interconnected. Yes. Yeah, and, and it's going to close off if it's if something else is stuck. Yes, yeah. and so from I treated this child once a week from May to July, and there was a vocabulary explosion. This Sweet. child was already absorbing all the things from its environment. It was the expression that was inhibited. Mm. And just through creating structures, we mm. improved function um, on so many levels. That's awesome. And, it's uh, exciting to get a yes. result like that. And, <laughs> yes. and I don't think that that's atypical for you. Right? No, not at practice. all. And I think people listening might be kind of like, wow, that sounds a little far-fetched. Mm -hmm. But we really do need a shift in the way that we think about our healthcare. I mean, that, this is one of the things I constantly yes. harp on. We, we really are limited in our conception of what we think is possible. Mm -hmm. But that is heavily belied by an enormous amount of so-called, you know, miraculous or amazing results that for practitioners who think outside the box are day-to-day -day activities. Yes, daily. And one of the things that, you know, Introducing, introducing people to the perspective that the body does know how to self-correct. And a simple example that I use is that we can get a cut on our skin mm -hmm. and we don't have to stare at that with our conscious minds and say, <laughs> platelets collide, form a scab. You know, something in us knows how to do it. Uh -huh. And thank goodness, because I think we'd all walk around looking like zombies because nobody would take the time to do that. But um, really- like a good sci-fi to me. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what, what would happen? Yes, if we actually had to consciously heal ourselves. <laughs> but there is these subconscious processes that are happening in the body. Now, we, mm -hmm. now, this is where I believe that we need the perspective shift, is that there are conscious processes and there are non-conscious processes that are happening in the body. And that non-conscious process is that scab forming. We mm -hmm. are not controlling that. But we could use our conscious mind and support that process, right, right. apply an antibiotic, apply right. a bandage and support the process. And that healing happens more thoroughly and um, we expedite the process right, rather than right. if we um, ignored it and let it heal on its own. And it would happen. It its own thing. Yep, it yeah. would happen. It may have challenges along the way. Right. It could result in a scar. Right. Precisely. Um, 
however, if we bridge mm -hmm. our conscious processes mm -hmm. and our non-conscious processes, mm -hmm. then we really have the keys to health there. Yeah, and we've yeah, talked yeah. about um, how really the keys of health are consciousness. Right. And so one of the other things that I appreciate inviting people to explore or perspective change is that really dysfunction in the body from from my perspective looking at the body as this amazing self-correcting adaptive being um, is that really what's happening is a very instead of dysfunction mm -hmm. yes it may actually manifest as dysfunction but what's actually happening is a very beautiful adaptation. I see what you're saying, right, right. To whatever's happening in the mm -hmm. environment of that individual, whether it be internally or externally. Mm -hmm. And um, and so really even taking that back to the neurodivergent child um, and looking at what is happening in this child's environment, how are they processing the information? Uh, where is that? Where is that adaptation occurring for them? Right and meeting that where it's at. And again, we have seen children with all kinds of behavior disorders become a more centered, grounded, mm -hmm. um, uh, balanced being. Right. In, right. in really, children are beautiful. They shift so quickly yeah, 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 with yeah. the right support right. Um, that we usually see these changes happen within months yeah. of regular work, of regular awesome. therapy. One of the amazing things about uh, adaptation, and I, I love mm -hmm. the way you think about this and the way that you're, you're not uh, focusing on dysfunction, you're focusing on alternative function. Yeah. One of the things that I think is fascinating about that is like, yes, the body does have these layers of backup methods. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use an analogy to, to muscularity. Here. Mm -hmm. One of the things I see a lot is, is let's say someone... Um, is is working out or they have to do something quite strenuous with their arm and they overdo it. Mm -hmm. The muscles, they move from a sort of primary function. That primary function gets overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, what else can we do? Well, the muscle will spasm down to provide additional rigidity and support. It literally mm -hmm. becomes a trigger point. The neuromuscular activity of this shifts. And when that happens, we basically get some, some lack of function in this. It's become tuned towards one particular type of strength mm -hmm. and it loses flexibility. And then the next time that we want to use that muscle, we instead use the other adaptive form. Mm -hmm. We've lost access to this. We've adapted past a typical function, a more sort of broad function and more towards a specialized function. And that is good and bad depending on what's going on. Usually we want that muscle to let go of that adaptation and come back into the more typical environment. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times the environment that we adapt to is transient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is true for muscles. This is true for our neurologic system. It's true for trauma. Trauma is a very similar analogy to that. Mm -hmm. We develop a particular type of rigidity or adaptation to a, a big significant event. Yeah. But they're almost always very transitory. But our body is so defensive. Yeah. It's like, hey, preservation at, at the cost of flexibility. Yes. Right? So it locks down. And oftentimes... For instance, in chronic pain, I see this absolutely all the time. People come in and they've gone through the ringer with their MD. And, you know, eventually they get referred to the pain specialist and whatever, and they end up on meds for pain. Yeah. Opioid medicine. It's like, uh -huh. we can't figure out the cause of that. Let's just turn off the pain. Yeah. Like, Ooh, that is a big intervention. Mm -hmm. Now, rather than just using opioids to cover up the signal, we go back to try and figure out, well, why are we having pain? And it mm -hmm. comes back to that adaptation. Mm -hmm. And you can literally just do a trigger point injection, minimally invasive. I mean, heck, you don't even have to use any medicine for it. Sometimes we use numbing medicine, lidocaine. But it's actually just a targeted massage. That's all the trigger point injection is. Mm -hmm. You get to the point of that adaptation, and you communicate with it, right? We're just literally mechanically communicating to it. It's like, let go of that. Mm -hmm. And it unravels, and phew, pain is completely resolved and functions normal. Mm -hmm. Holy crap, right? It's like, yeah. it, we and don't, we I don't will, think about that enough. Yeah, and you know, going back to consciousness, um, the work that we do at, at our office, um, bringing consciousness to that space, so bringing, mm -hmm. bringing people's consciousness into that space, we can actually get a lot of clarity mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the adaptation. And literally, mm -hmm. once we have the clarity of the adaptation, the central nervous system 
will make a different choice. Right, right, right. right. And Just and seeing it. Yes. Yeah. And and oftentimes we see an instant change mm -hmm. in functionality just by bringing awareness right. um, right. that we usually see these changes happen within months yeah. of regular work, of regular awesome. therapy. So one of the amazing things about uh, adaptation, and I, I love mm -hmm. the way you think about this and the way that you're, you're not uh, focusing on dysfunction, you're focusing on alternative function. Yeah. One of the things that I think is fascinating about that is like, yes, the body does have these layers of backup methods. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use an analogy to, to muscularity. Here. Mm -hmm. One of the things I see a lot is, let's say someone um, is, is working out or they have to do something quite strenuous with their arm and they overdo it. Mm -hmm. The muscles, they move from a sort of primary function. That primary function gets overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, what else can we do? Well, the muscle will spasm down to provide additional rigidity and support. It literally mm -hmm. becomes a trigger point. The neuromuscular activity of this shifts. And when that happens, we basically get some, some lack of function in this. It's become tuned towards one particular type of strength. Mm -hmm. And it loses flexibility. And then the next time that we want to use that muscle, we instead use the other adapted form. Mm -hmm. We've lost access to this. We've adapted past a typical function, a more sort of broad function, and more towards a specialized function. And that is good and bad, depending on what's going on. Usually, we want that muscle to let go of that adaptation and come back into the more typical environment. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, the environment that we adapt to is transient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is true for muscles. This is true for our neurologic system. It's true for trauma. Trauma is a very similar analogy to that. Mm -hmm. We develop a particular type of rigidity or adaptation to a, a big significant event, yeah. but they're almost always very transitory. But our body is so defensive. Yeah. It's like, hey, preservation at, at the cost of flexibility. Yes. Right? So it locks down. And oftentimes, for instance, in chronic pain, I see this absolutely all the time. People come in and they've gone through the ringer with their MD. And, you know, eventually they get referred to the pain specialist and whatever, and they end up on meds for pain. Yeah. Opioid medicine. It's like, uh -huh. we can't figure out the cause of that. Let's just turn off the pain. Yeah. Like, Ooh, that is a big intervention. Mm -hmm. Now, rather than just using opioids to cover up the signal, we go back to try and figure out, well, why are we having pain? And it mm -hmm. comes back to that adaptation. Mm hmm. And you can literally just do a certain point injection, minimally invasive. I mean, heck, you don't even have to use any medicine for it. Sometimes we use numbing medicine, lidocaine. But it's actually just a targeted massage. That's all the trigger point injection is. Mm -hmm. You get to the point of that adaptation, and you communicate with it, right? We're just literally mechanically communicating to it. It's like, let go of that. Mm -hmm. And it unravels, and phew, pain is completely resolved and function is normal. Mm -hmm. Holy crap, right? It's like... Yeah. It, we and don't, we I don't will think about that enough. Yeah, and you know, going back to consciousness, um, the work that we do at at our office, um, bringing consciousness to that space. So bringing mm -hmm. bringing people's consciousness into that space, we can actually get a lot of clarity mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the adaptation. And literally, mm -hmm. once we have the clarity of the adaptation, the central nervous system will make a different choice. Right, 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 right. And Just and seeing it, yes. Yeah. And, and oftentimes we see an instant change mm -hmm. in functionality just by bringing awareness. Um, and that's a very skilled practitioner mm -hmm. that knows how to bring awareness to that area and how to work with the central nervous system. Yeah. But yes, our muscular uh, system is neurologically based. Really, everything's neurologically based. Everything goes back to it, the it central is the nervous system. It is the interface between our consciousness and our physicality. Yes. Yes. And so... We can we can actually access these spaces, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. when and really that is one of the goals of craniosacral therapy is actually bridging um, conscious the consciousness and the non conscious processes of the body because when we can mm -hmm. going back to flexibility take our awareness through those different layers of consciousness, mm -hmm. man, do the doors open for us? Yeah, we yeah. have no idea what our human potential is yet. Right. Absolutely. Right. Well, and this is, of course, the focus of, for instance, yoga practices. Mm -hmm. It's building conscious awareness of unconscious kind of automated practices in the human body. Yeah. And again, it kind of branches into the realm of the hard to believe yeah. for our culture, right? Our society is 
quite, uh, is this fair to say, maybe this is too strong of a phrase, but propagandized mm. to believe that this is what reality is, mm -hmm. this is what medicine is, this is what's possible. There's a lot of rigidity in the way that we perceive reality and are taught through our in institutions to yeah. perceive reality. But if we, if we even step outside of that a little bit, if we kind of go, okay, well, let me just consider that perhaps there's more, mm -hmm. we suspend our disbelief for a minute, we see in all these other cultures things that just completely blow that out of the water. Mm -hmm. You know, having a child with a result like you're describing mm -hmm. is the sort of thing that if any given MD would listen to that and go, well, maybe that's possible, they see it, they go, I'm missing something here, mm -hmm. right? It creates this whole shift. Similarly, anyone who is interested in their own health, they look at what is possible in, in Eastern medical systems or mm -hmm. yoga systems or um, many, many different things. They just have that suspension of disbelief and they go, I didn't think that was possible. Yeah. And like, oh, there's a lot that we yeah. are in disbelief of, but absolutely is not hard to find examples of. And I, I think a lot of people in modern medicine and the sort of scientific community would decry those as outliers. They're like, I don't know, that's just, Sometimes stuff yeah. happens, mm -hmm. right? And and that's partially a problem of us having this sort of uh, standardized medicine, this sort of everyone is on the statistical norm. Mm -hmm. But those outliers are not discountable information, right? We shouldn't discount them. That just shows us more broadness to what's actually happening. Yeah, yeah. It's tricky, right? Yeah, and you know, so back to the really what's happening as a dysfunction and what we see in our Western medical society as a dysfunction, if we can look at it through the lens of an, of an intelligent adaptation mm. of the human body, mm -hmm. um, but also um, going back to neurodivergency and how really that central nervous system is adapting, how it's responding to its environment based on something it's experienced. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is, this is something that I talk about with parents all the time. They're like, but, but where's, when did it happen? Why did it happen? Mm. How, you know, how do we get there? Natural questions. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, how did we get to the dysfunction? Where, where was this actually an intelligent adaptation? Uh -huh, uh -huh, right. And um, one of my favorite places um, to point people is birthpsychology.com. Mm. There is so much information about how, you know, and this is getting into epigenetics, um, mm -hmm. how, how, environmental influences are actually impacting our cellular health mm -hmm. and how that's mm -hmm. happening in utero yeah. and even yeah. preconception. Yeah. yeah. And, right, right. and then when we look at, and, and this is something that the, the standardized medical community does accept now, yes. even though I think most people haven't heard of this. Yes. Yes. And so, and then even going back further than that, when we get into genetics themselves, mm -hmm. like this may be an inherited dysfunction, but somewhere in the lifetime of our lineage, mm -hmm. it was a very intelligent adaptation. Right, right. And now we have an individual who's inherited this and actually it doesn't apply. Sort of long-term epigenetic change. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And so um, we can trace neurodivergent patterns back to exposures, mm. to illnesses, to viruses, bacterias, mm. to, um, you know, emotional distress mm -hmm. um, that possibly the child experienced in utero right, right. Um, and can be the root of neurodivergency. Now, the, the amazing, amazing, miraculous thing is, is that it is all changeable. We uh, are, uh, as uh, much as the adaptation was made, if we can then support and break out of that rigidity mm -hmm. and, and, and then the flex, you know, and that's what I tell people, the flexibility in our craniosacral systems is neuroplasticity it is uh -huh. the mm -hmm. the central nervous system's ability to actually make different neural pathways mm -hmm. to have to have different connections form instead of being locked into this dysfunctional pattern that they are right and so you know our physical bodies really are representations of what's happening on all the layers of us right um and we can shift those yeah. and we can shift those through physical, you know, and in craniosacral therapy, we are hands-on, mm -hmm. um, but we do also explore the mental aspect um, of somebody's experience, um, the emotional aspect of somebody's experience. We can address these with cognitive behaviors, mm -hmm. uh, therapies. We can address this with 
uh, with psychotherapy, mm-hmm. talk therapy, mm-hmm. um, and you know, and then for some who are willing to go there, even get into the spiritual um, right. aspect of all of this. I, I think people really we have become acclimated to a type of fast food medicine yeah. in the West. Yeah. And it's very much, I go and I place my order and the, the person gives me my, my Mickey D's in a bag. Yeah. And I, I pound it and it's done. Yeah. Right? And, and the reality is that human health has to be engagement-based. Mm-hmm. We have to engage with our own body to understand our health. And you're exactly right. It has to happen on that tripartite level, right? That's mm-hmm. why I call this Atma Clinic, Atma from the old Sanskrit word that means total self. Mm, the yes. mind, the body, and the spirit. We're, we are a clinic for mm-hmm. that. And I chose that name because that's how we have to appreciate health if we're going to get fundamentally new results. Yeah, We're so hyper-focused on the body and the chemistry and the neurochemistry. And that's good, right? Mm-hmm. We want to advance those things. But also, the more we advance those things, the more we suddenly realize that can't exist without the mind. Yeah. And ultimately, I contend, we'll get to the point we understand that that is intimately interwoven with the spiritual. Yes. And we see that happening already with the idea of the mind-gut connection. I think a lot of people are kind of familiar with that now. When we think about neurodivergency, there's an increasing amount of study thinking about the neurochemistry created in the gut Mm -hmm. that travels up the vagus nerve to the brain. That's all kind of standard accepted science now. Yes, through the glial cells. Right. Yes. And and yet, we don't have a lot of therapies built on that science in the conventional Mm -hmm. medical community. People are kind of like, okay, that exists. I accept that. Is someone going to tell me what to do with that? Yes. (laughs) You know? Yes. And it's like, okay, well, here we are talking about that. Yes. And they're like, oh, that's BS. Like, well, hang on. You wanted the answers. Yeah. And so including all of these different elements is really pushing the science in a fundamental sense. Yeah. I, I think we're quite captured as a as a culture and certainly as a scientific community with the idea of these massive, completely unsustainably expensive, randomized, double blind controlled studies. Like mm-hmm. if it doesn't go through that, I'm not listening to it. I'm not going to change my practice. Yeah. And it's yes. like, well you're going to be waiting a long time for this stuff to come out. Whereas, where do those come from? Fundamentally, those come from anecdotal studies. They mm-hmm. come from people who are pushing the envelope, like mm-hmm. yourself, who say, hey, I had, a completely, I had a completely amazing result that doesn't fit into this mm-hmm. idea. Yeah. Shouldn't we pay attention to that? The yes. answer is, yeah, if we want to advance the science. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times, you know, nowadays, our medical system, sadly, is more uh, entrenched with maintaining itself and being a business and maintaining insurance and hospitals and all this stuff, Mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of physician scientists anymore. Yeah. And it's amazing to me that a lot of, a lot of that responsibility has now uh, fallen onto people like ourselves who may be MDs or not MDs, but it doesn't mean that what you're doing isn't scientific. It is in fact replicable. Mm -hmm. It is something that you can start to, you know, have these conversations and say, well, you know, why don't, why don't we think about this? Why don't we dig into this? And then eventually, we can have people kind of go, well, yeah, I'd like to go see CT for, you know, for for optimizing my neurologic state. And then they get their own results. Mm -hmm. We would see pancreatitis all the time that didn't fit into the box. Yes. And I was like, well, okay, shouldn't we ask questions about this? Mm -hmm. Like, now those are the four causes, if they're an outlier, whatever. It's like, I've seen more outliers of pancreatitis than I have inliers. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And so that led me down a journey, quite a journey. Um, That's when I met you. Mm -hmm. Um, My Mm -hmm. Western medical system Mm -hmm. could not support me. Mm -hmm. I literally, while I was in the hospital, they were just giving me pain meds and Mm -hmm. watching my pancreas calm down. Mm -hmm. I was just Mm -hmm. under observation. And I literally had a surgeon come in and say, we want to take your gallbladder out. Mm -hmm. And I said, why do you want to take my gallbladder out? Because it could have contributed to your (laughs) pancreatitis. And I said, my gallbladder was scanned and they told me it was clear in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, but it's mm-hmm. usually, you know, you don't ever want to experience this again. We should take it out. And mm-hmm. I said, um, I would like to discuss this with my medical providers mm-hmm. of choice before making such a decision. And we squashed that conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. when I, I found you. And mm-hmm. you started talking to me about gut health. Mm-hmm. My exploration of gut health was quite a journey. Mm-hmm. Um, when um, I, I was overweight, 
Um, I'm, I'm still working with that. And I was, I had incredible dysbiosis. Mm. And once we actually started to get down to the, you know, roots of my dysbiosis and I could experience life without dysbiosis, uh, my yeah, entire yeah. central nervous system calmed down. Yeah. I no longer had joint and back pain. Mm. I no longer was short tempered. Uh, I had uh -huh. mental clarity mm. and my entire life started to change. Yeah. And yeah. then when I actually needed to change my food and when that was a struggle for me, um, I sought further help in mm -hmm. in outside mm -hmm. realms um, mm -hmm. as far as you know ad approaching it from the lens of addiction, mm -hmm. and then realizing the roots of my food behaviors mm -hmm. were actually mm -hmm. due to trauma, and it was a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so my it's an amazing story. It's, yeah, it's been quite a journey. And then you know I found spirituality in mm -hmm. digging into my physical health, and um, I and yeah. learned how interconnected. Um, my my cognitive functioning was to my physical health mm. and how all of that led back to a spiritual connection that was void from my life before. Mm. And once it was um, introduced and put in place, things are aligning for me on levels of my life. Like that dominoes. I, I could have never <laughs> dreamed possible. Yeah. And um, how oftentimes I find families when I work mm. with neurodivergent children who are in the same dysfunctional patterns with their food, mm -hmm. with their relationships, mm -hmm. with their environment, mm -hmm. with technology. Um, they're in these same dysfunctional patterns that I used to find myself in. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and some people are willing to learn more and, and go on this long, you know, the long game journey. Mm -hmm. And, um, and some people actually choose not to. Yeah. Right. I think what's most stunning to me about that, Kind of pulling back and seeing the broad picture because that's that's an amazing story like if we think of that mm -hmm. that journey that you've gone through there were kind of two choices you know if you had stuck with the conventional medical system oh. where would that have led you and and i think a lot of people go oh yeah i know what wow. that's like oh my goodness and it, oh. it's a dangerous place because yes. it, it disintegrates us it leads Absolutely. us further and further away from understanding what's going on and the more pharmaceutical complexity we get the more yeah. we chop out organs, the the less natural the body is, the harder it is to maintain its own homeostasis and balance. Absolutely. Right? And we get further and further and further dysfunction. Right. And then to the path back from that right. it's, is it's almost unimaginable. Very challenging. And we help people with that all the time. And of course, I tell people, you know, we want to get to the root of things. And if we must unpack, like we see a lot of polypharmacy basically just meaning that people are on eight plus. Oh, medicine. yes. Every time that someone has a pharmaceutical, they're very powerful mm -hmm. and they, they're great in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. But if they're kind of used pell-mell, people end up with all of these pharmaceuticals, which are kind of like pulling the body in all these different directions. Yeah. And it's like, okay, now go dance ballet. Yeah. While, you know, I'm pulling on your arm and your leg and your thigh over here. And it's like, I'm all bound up. I can't get into that. Mm -hmm. I, kind of pulling back, I think the thing that, that I find the most fascinating is that stories like what you're telling are actually, I think, in our society, uh, the norm. In a yeah. Sense. I wish that more people had your, uh, what's the right way to say this, your openness to thinking more broadly, your, your determination to say, no, no, I want a solution. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of people who can resonate with, okay, yeah, I've, I'm at this place with my health and I don't know how to go forward mm -hmm. on it. And I love that having this conversation, I hope for a lot of people opens up this idea that I should really, I should get back and try it again. I think a lot of people become hopeless. Yes. Because they find themselves yeah. in dire straits and they go, I don't know, right. And they go to a practitioner, often an MD, mm -hmm. often who has 10 minutes, yes. often who is, you know, bound by the standard of care that insurance will pay for. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. MDs are intelligent, compassionate people, but they're in a system. Yeah, there's second boxes too. There's that saying, the cage makes the beast. Yeah. Right? And so they go to this MD and the MD says, okay, we got 10 minutes. Oh my God, that's really complicated. Okay, here's a pill. Yeah. Right? It's like, what can you do in 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. And so individuals, if they're dogged, they might, if they're determined, they might say, well, doc, let me see you in a week and we're going to keep on going. Like, mm -hmm. treat me in 10 minute chunks if that's the best we can do. One of the things that really uh, 
caused my own shift in practice where I was like, I have to start my own business and start a parallel medical system Mm -hmm. outside of insurance Mm -hmm. was that I had patients who came to me and I wanted to get deeper. And we had to work on that timing of, okay, you know, I've got four patients this hour. Mm -hmm. And even like, it's much worse nowadays. People will have eight patients in an hour they have to treat. Mm -hmm. And I would bring people back Mm -hmm. and we try to dig in. And then insurance just said, well, we're not paying for that. Yeah. You know, like, sure. You're treating what, you know, pancreatitis, let's say, Mm -hmm. You saw them last week. We don't want to pay for that. Yeah. Oh my God. I gotta, how yeah. do we help this person? And so the more that, that people hear messaging like this, they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, I went to an MD and they weren't able to get me what I needed. Mm-hmm. My advice to people is please continue to look further afield and do it with people who are scientific and who are mm-hmm. thoughtful and with whom you resonate and feel a connection. You know, that, that's, you know, trust your intuition. That's a good idea. Trust your gut feeling about something. Um, Certainly, there are practitioners who aren't as savvy and profound. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are people who are really, really darn good at what they do who are outside of the conventional medical system. So we have to push Mm -hmm. because our medical system is not doing the diligence that people know they need. And unfortunately, people then just accept that. They're like, oh, there's no cure. I'll just just put up with pancreatitis or I'll just put up with X, Y, and Z rather than really trusting their gut. Like, no, there's something wrong, damn it. Like, how do I get into that? Yes. And this is one of the, I think, wonderful things about the internet. At least now people can do their own research and they can go, okay, let me get on a forum and oh, okay. And I have piles of patients who come to me with this sort of situation where they go, I need someone who thinks outside the box. Yeah. I do think that a big, um, (laughs) I, I, I often find myself resorting to militaristic analogies and terms. And I'm like, ah, maybe that's a little too combative. But, <laughs> but I do think that one big new battlefield is neurologic health, yeah. broadly. I yeah. certainly don't think that COVID has helped that at all. Yeah. We have all of these neurotoxins, mm-hmm. you know, what to speak of, of the sort of total unknown realm of uh, electromagnetic field interruption, which mm-hmm. I, I will uh, put my foot down strongly and say it absolutely affects human health. Mm-hmm. From a strictly scientific point of view, I will also add the addendum. We don't know to what degree, yeah. but absolutely it does affect us. But we know that there's this rise in neuroinflammation from that's, a billion different sources. I that's mean, exactly. Obviously I'm hyperbolic, but there's a yes. lot of nuance there. Yes. And people have to push. Yeah. You know, if we've got a kiddo that isn't uh, sensing correctly, mm-hmm. isn't sensory processing, we have to we have to really pound the table and say, well, why, damn it? You know, let's yeah. figure this out. And again, I don't like people to kind of hit a dead end. And mm-hmm. you're like, okay, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to put you in, you know, occupational therapy, and mm-hmm. we'll try to, you know, work it. No, no. What is the root of that? Yes. You know, we really should be fighting for that. Yes, and um, you know, one of one family that that I that I worked with that was just a joy was. Um, the mother is a nurse at Children's Mercy Hospital. Right. And this, and her children were neurodivergent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, she had very, uh, lots access to lots of resources mm-hmm. as a staff member. And she got diagnoses. She got uh, pharmaceutical intervention. She got scripts for um, OT um, mm-hmm. to also work with it. And she wasn't seeing shifting happen. Mm-hmm. And um, she was also seeing the negative impacts of the mm-hmm. pharmaceutical on her children. And she was yeah, seeing yeah. how that's not my child anymore. Yeah, oh, that's scary. And yeah. um, luckily, a friend of hers um, was familiar with craniosacral therapy and said, why don't you just try this out? Doesn't hurt to try. Things, Never right? And yes, there's no, there's no contraindications. Yeah. I shouldn't say no uh, contraindications, but there are. It's a harmless therapy. Yeah. Um, it's a very gentle, hands-on, non-invasive um, intervention. And so she brought her kids. We, we did some work, and she saw things from a completely different mm-hmm. perspective. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you um, how it's changed their world. That's awesome. And uh, well, Thank you for doing that work, right? Yes. Like, that's so cool. And then I love to see that echo out, yes. right? Because someone rolling the dice, being open, and saying, well, why don't we try this? Mm-hmm. Then that echoes out, that ripples out, and people can people gather more openness. And then that's legitimately how we progress the science, mm-hmm. right? We're quite stuck in medical dogmas as a society, and there's incredibly complicated reasons that's happened. 
but we're not working fast enough as a scientific community yes. to solve our novel problem. Yeah. We're having accelerations of technology mm -hmm. and with every new technology comes new challenges. Yeah. You know, I think, well, I won't get too far into a tangent on all of this, but, <laughs> but you know, we have so much acceleration. Yeah. And you know, now we're even getting to the point of thinking about, you know, Elon Musk's Neuralink and we're going to kind of chip people and they're going to mm -hmm. connect. And it's like, okay, obviously very tempting, but the ramifications of this for human biology and us as an integrated whole are going to be, dare I say, just bonkers. Yeah. Like it's going to be such a huge shift in how our consciousness attempts to connect with our body through yeah. this other thing. And so we have all this acceleration. And it's like, we're not keeping pace. Yeah. We are still trying to keep pace. We're trying to adapt to, okay, well, what has happened with COVID? Mm -hmm. Okay, what is happening with all of this uh, EMF interference from mm -hmm. cell phones, Wi-Fi? What's happening with all this neurochemical engineering? What's happening with our gut-brain connection from all the biome shift from all of these frankenfoods, right? Like, we're yeah. so behind as a society yeah. on adapting health technology yeah. to environmental challenges. Yes, Whew. yes. Wow. And yeah, and what and the collateral damage yeah. that's happening in that lag time. Well, yeah, absolutely. Is, is immense. And there's a lot of like, oh, you know, slow and steady wins the race. We don't want to, you know, hurt people by accelerating research too much. And like, I can appreciate that. But then we talk about a <laughs> researching an intervention that has basically no side effects. And they're like, no, no, no. Like, well, hang on, guys. Like, then what? Yeah. And it's funny that we're actually identifying a dichotomy here. You know, the slow and steady wins the race in a fast paced medical system that just yeah, wants yeah, to yeah. push things through. And Tricky. so, yeah. There's no easy answer. <laughs> There's not. And, you know, when I talk about the changes that I've experienced in, in my own life um, through taking alternative routes mm -hmm. and getting to roots and cores and making real shifts in my mm -hmm. environment and in my practices that are supporting me in my health and well-being, um, you know, people will say like, well, how long has that taken you? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I'm like, right, I'm about yeah. a decade in, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, I embarked on this, you know, mm -hmm. book, you know, before mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I would have said, I, you know, life's great, life's fine. And then all of a sudden everything broke down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, but in a productive fashion, right? You know, it, it, it turned out to be there was so much silver lining. Mm -hmm. You know, um, systems, you know, established relationships and systems had to crumble for mm -hmm. me to actually, you know, discover, discover what, what my own potential was, mm -hmm. my own truth, my own being, and, and just really experiencing the influence of, my foods mm -hmm. um, being on, conscious and present with them. yes yeah. yes on my body on my mind mm -hmm. and then how that actually translated into my output my interactions with people mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know being short tempered and being um, pessimistic mm -hmm. and aggressive mm -hmm. affected my relationships and right, which affected yeah. my world I mean it the it's it's huge and it mm -hmm. all went back to these practices of of overall health and well-being um mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. many of them are rooted in food uh -huh. um and mm -hmm. many of them are rooted in toxicity mm -hmm. and um and toxicity on many levels it's i i think people listening i i hope they feel a little inspired to kind of uh go beyond the typical mm -hmm. in their own health challenges and as you're saying, you know, I, I want to kind of summarize this, and please correct me if I'm summarizing it in a way that isn't doing justice to your journey. It, it, it's a process of allocating resources. Mm -hmm. We have to spend time and consciousness with ourselves. We yeah. have to be present. Mm -hmm. We have to say, hey, this is important to me. We can't just order fast food health. Yeah. We have to actually cook the darn thing ourselves and get, you know, chef fancy with it and give yeah. it the little salt bay, you know, like let's let's get yeah. into yeah. to what does it take to do that because no one's coming to save us on this yeah you know people like you and i are trying to encourage people but we're not the saviors on that we are mm -hmm. we are the coaches we are yeah. the supporters we are the okay awesome you really wanted to be healthy you really want to feel fantastic mm -hmm. cool let us figure out how we can dig in and support that yeah but there is first and foremost that question of, of investment mm -hmm. and you know maybe at this juncture the way that the system is kind of organized works out okay. 
Mm -hmm. Because people who want to do that deeper dive will come and see us, mm -hmm. right? They they figure it out. They watch something like this, and they go like, okay, yeah, let me put my let me put my time where my mouth is. Let me go check this out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I want to really encourage people just to to do that. It doesn't have to be with Susie or I, mm -hmm. you know. But but do think about that process in your own health, and and of course the other side to this is do also be skeptical, but be legitimately skeptical. Be skeptical of the whole thing, right? In, in yes. an honest fashion. It's like yes. we want to be discerning. Yeah. You know, because there are practitioners of all sorts of skill levels. I will say, right? yeah. One of the struggles that individuals who are really on the cutting edge, like like dare I say you and I are, face is that there's also a lot of people who, who say they do similar things but aren't on the cutting edge. Yeah. So there, there is a place for uh, discernment and skepticism. Yeah. People have to go, okay, I, I click with that provider. And most fundamentally, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Yeah. That provider gets me results. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, I get, I get that question. I get questions from people a lot as far as, this therapy versus that mm -hmm, therapy and mm -hmm. and i tell people all the time try it try it with an yeah, open yeah, mind yeah. and really sit with how is this affecting me mm -hmm. um because there are going to be different interventions and different therapies that support people mm -hmm. in in ways that are more meaningful than other people right right and there is uh, no one size fits all there is no yeah, one yeah. size fits all and so try this and really sit with it be with it um, see, see, is it, is this actually working and is this something that's sustainable? Uh huh. Right. Right. Which is a very key question a on many question. levels. Yes. A yeah. very personal question. Um, and, and begin and begin to, to build your team, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. your support system yeah. and your path. It's, it, it's, it's hard work, but as the meme goes, it's honest work. Yes. Right. Like it, it's something that if people aren't feeling perfect, I tell people, you know, we should be fussy. We should be perfectionists about our health. Yeah. And if something isn't perfect, don't accept that imperfection. Mm -hmm. Push for it, you know, go further and try to figure out, okay, how do I want to feel? I deserve to feel that way. Mm -hmm. Let me figure this out. Yeah. And then find, find practitioners that can support you in that. Absolutely. That's awesome. Well, Susie, we could just keep on going. I know. I know. We always we'll do have when to have we get back. together. <laughs> I'd love to have another filming session and we can kind of dig into some more fun stuff. Oh, lots of fun stuff. Thank you for joining Thanks. me very much. Susie Roman, everybody. Uh